Welcome back to this video podcast edition of 12 Days in March. This material was delivered during a series of live lectures at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. In this recording, we review the key features of aerobic exercise physiology for the USMLE Step 1 exam. As with all presentations, a PDF of this recording is available at the 12 Days website. This is a sidebar that I love. This is a sloth exercising. And so the question is, like, why don't we die during exercise? Right? Think about it. Sympathetic nervous system is activated, alpha-1, so now we have blood pressure up, resistance is up, cardiac work, now the heart has to push against this increased resistance, and the vessel walls are going to get thick, and we should die a miserable, cold, lonely death, yet we don't die. The key thing about exercise, and to get you out of this jam, focus on the local responses. If you just think about what's going on locally, you'll be fine on exercise physiology. And this is aerobic exercise, not static exercise. Static exercise, like weightlifting, I only see on the cue banks, never on the boards. So the first thing we have to do, we have to keep up the cardiac output. We're exercising, right? And the way we're doing that is we're turning off the parasympathetic, which is interfering with sympathetic. So sympathetic nervous system is flying, and you guys are great on beta-1 heart rate, contractility. Do think about venoconstriction. Remember, the veins also are innervated, and we're bringing that unstressed volume back into the bloodstream uh, stress volume. So we're increasing our venous return. That's really important. All right. We have to increase blood flow, this is first and foremost, to the coronary vessels to keep up while we exercise. So how are we going to get increased coronary blood flow? And the vessels have to vasodilate. What's causing them to vasodilate? Local responses. Hypoxia, but adenosine and nitric oxide are going to cause coronary vessel vasodilation during exercise. So that's good. And by the way, when you exercise, you should be thinking about this and put it to the test. This, to me, is the most important thing that helps me get my arms around keeping up with cardiac output. Is skeletal muscle, as a result of lactate production, hyperkalemia, adenosine, again, adenosine, vasodilate, causes the vessels in our skeletal muscles to vasodilate. And when you vasodilate, just like we saw with septic shock, vasodilate, you decrease afterload. And our heart does much better with decreased afterload. So with exercise, our skeletal muscle dilates and it helps with our forward fraction of blood. Yeah, we have coronary blood flow, but we have decreased afterload, which increases our stroke volume. And, and when you see it in this setting, technically it increases our pulse pressure too, but we don't care about that, they don't ask. So we have an increased stroke volume. And remember, epinephrine is also going off, stimulates beta-2 receptors that are good for our lungs, but also cause a little beta dilation. So this is the big thing with exercise. Even though we have a lot of cardiac output and we have the sympathetic nervous system stimulated, including alpha-1 adrenergics, ultimately local vasodilation trumps the day. All right, and then we're vasoconstricting flow to other sites, including the kidney. And this is one of the issues marathoners to take uh, non-steroidals during the long runs. They're already hypoperfusing the kidney. Prostaglandins should maintain perfusion. You take a non-steroidal, and you can wind up with ischemic renal damage with strenuous exercise. PO2, PCO2, pH, they don't really change. And here I'm throwing in pulmonary because this is the other thing, because the cardiac is going to make you bored while you're running, but you can think, well, what are the lungs doing? The main response on the lungs is increased tidal volume, and what you're doing, where's that coming from? It's that dead space up top. You're recruiting dead space. Airways will bronchodilate, both from the chest wall pulling on the airways, but again, I told you about epinephrine, that beta-2 agonist is causing bronchodilation, so we're moving our tidal volume better. And the bigger issue is we have increased cardiac output on the left side, so you have to match that on the right side. Where's that coming from? Capillary recruitment, namely in the areas you're not normally perfusing in the apices, now you're perfusing those. So interestingly, and again with sustained exercise, not sprinting, your respiratory rate stays about the same, and it's these measures, and you're making lactate, but you're hyperventilating, that maintain the pH. PCO2 actually goes down while we exercise, and the PO2 is maintained. Great stuff. Fun fact. So resistance decreases due to skeletal muscle dilating. Well, why does our blood pressure actually go up? Our blood pressure rises while we're exercised. And it's really just a balance of what's going on. So increased stroke volume. This is to keep up our cardiac output. Venus return, alpha ones. So we have increased stroke volume and heart rate. But the real issue is, although our pressure goes up, it's that change in peripheral resistance at the skeletal muscle that goes down and makes it so our blood pressure doesn't go off the wall while we're exercised. So it's perfectly fine if anybody feels like exercising this afternoon, okay? 
Now, here's the thing, is that we, you know, this line that myocardial oxygen consumption is maxed out. We're already extracting all the oxygen we can and should through our coronary vessels, and that's pretty good. We get 80% at baseline. When we exercise, we're able to kick that up to 90%. So if they ask you a question, what's going on with myocardial oxygen consumption, it does go up. Okay, but the only way we can keep up with oxygen demands is increased coronary blood flow. Okay, so these are trick questions in the Q-banks, but they underscore the physiology here. This question about the AVO2 difference, is it biggest between the aorta and the coronary sinus, or is it the biggest difference between the aorta and the IVC? Yeah, it's coronary sinus because the coronary vessels are extracting more oxygen out of the circulation. So the PaO2, the coronary sinus is only 20. If someone highlight that to you, it's like, oh, yeah, that makes perfect sense. That makes absolute perfect sense. You know, it's extracting more oxygen. It's more efficient at it. So the difference between the aorta and the coronary sinus should be a greater difference. Just didn't want that one to slip by on you. And not to beat the coronary sinus to death, but where does it drain? It drains in the right atrium. So with pulmonary hypertension or right atrium enlargement, what's going on with the coronary sinus? It dilates. I mean, these are just stupid coronary sinus things. Who the hell even thinks about the coronary sinus? Not me. But once you point out the idea of pulmonary hypertension, sure, that makes sense. Coronary sinus is going to dilate. And that's that. So that was just a little side. And that concludes this discussion of aerobic exercise for the USMLE Step 1 exam. If you have any questions or concerns, please email me at 12 Days in March. Thank you.